trying to be funny. Yep. Today we'll be in John chapter 20, start at verse 19, go through the end of the chapter. It says, after, after Jesus' resurrection, he appears to his disciples, and then he appears to Thomas later on. We don't know where Thomas was, but he was not there with the rest of them the first time Jesus appears. Our main point today is Jesus appeared so people would believe in him. So John chapter 20, we'll start at verse 19. And we'll go down through verse, I think it's 31 is the end of the chapter. It says, That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said this, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, just as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. And that's John chapter 20, 19 through 31. Of course, background for this. Jesus had risen victoriously from the grave. He conquered death and sin for all time. He appeared to different people. Several times he appeared to people who knew him very well, but they didn't recognize him right away. Because we think, how could that be? When he first appeared to, to Mary there by the tomb, she didn't recognize him. He's on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize him right away. Think, can someone name me a really famous person? Just any old, any famous person who comes to mind. Hey, name me a famous person. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Okay, how about a famous person that's alive today? Because <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't work for my, my thing here. Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp. Okay, yeah, he's in, he's in the news lately. <laughs> You've been keeping up with, with that saga. That's craziness, but yeah, I ain't watched a day of it. I don't know, yeah, but it's, it, I know what, yeah, he's out there. Yeah, so Johnny Depp. So let's say that old Mr. Depp came to our church one day. He wasn't, he was dressed just like the rest of us. There was no security around. And perhaps he wasn't made up like you see him in the, in the movies. He's not, you know, Captain Jack and doing his, you know, weird little hand stuff. <laughs> You might look and go, huh, that that looks familiar. But we might not believe it was them. Again, especially if they're not made up like they are on screen. Especially, you know, if makeup and visual effects can really change how how a person appears. So why would we not believe? Ah, they're too famous. They don't live around here. If this person was, who the person was, they'd have a big entourage following them. They'd be, Attention seekers and people want autographs and they take pictures. 
Of course, I'd probably want to take a picture too. We might not believe it was actually this person because everything just wouldn't add up. They're famous. Why are they here? How come they're not surrounded by people? Just wouldn't make sense. You can hear all the people that loved Jesus, that knew Jesus, they knew he died. They, many of them watched him breathe his last while he hung on the cross. They knew that he was placed in a tomb. They knew he was dead. In their mind, there was no way he could be standing in front of them three days later. It just didn't make sense. Even though he told them over and over and over what would happen, it wasn't until after that they it all clicked. Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. She didn't recognize him at first, but when she did, she ran to tell the disciples. And they didn't believe her. They wanted to see it with their own eyes. I don't know. We know two, two of the apostles run to the tomb. Who gets there first? Yes. And we know about it because John wrote it, right? I'm faster than... Yep, then Jesus appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. He started from the very beginning of the Scriptures and explained to them that he was the Messiah. Jesus wanted them to understand God's plan and believe in him. He wants the same for us today. And then when he broke the bread with them, their eyes were, oh, that's Jesus. And then he's gone. He disappeared. The two disciples ran back to find the other disciples and tell them that Jesus was alive. But still, they didn't believe until they had seen Jesus. And while the two were there, Jesus he appears. Most of the Jesus' original disciples, or at least the apostles, were gathered. It says here, the disciples, so we might you could just assume might have just been the apostles, could have been some others there. But they had locked themselves in a room to hide. They were hiding from the Jewish leaders who demanded that Jesus be killed. The disciples thought they were in danger. We're close followers of Jesus. If they killed him, maybe they'll come looking for us. So... We'll go hide. In addition, the Roman guards had lied, said the disciples had stolen the body. Maybe they thought, well, if this lie gets big enough and big enough, yeah, we could be facing more persecution. But suddenly, Jesus was in the room with them. The locked door didn't stop him. Because his disciples were scared, his first words were of comfort. Peace. Seems to be the case when with, with Jesus or an angel appears to people, people were scared. Whoa, don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Fear not is the big thing when a, a heavenly being shows up. Fear not. Jesus told these men, the ones who deserted him, the ones who ran in fear, the ones that were hiding behind the locked door, that he was going to be sending them out. We've read the Great Commission before. They were going to all the world, teaching and preaching and baptizing, making disciples. Have people follow everything that Jesus said. Oh, why would Jesus send these men? They blew it, right? We'll fall asleep in the garden while Jesus is praying. Eh. You're arrested. We're going to, we run away. Only John was the one, was the only one there at the cross. They blew it, right? On their own, they had no strength. They had no courage. But was Jesus going to send them out on their own? No, in our, our opening reading, when, when service started, would, Jesus was going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Advocate, however your translation words it. It's all, it all means the same. He would not send them out on their own. In our passage that we just read, it says, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Because we know the Holy Spirit didn't come, on, come until Acts chapter 2. Of course, this is theorized that it's, it's, it's a symbol of what would happen. And otherwise, what about Thomas? Did Thomas have to go, you know, 40 some more days without the Spirit? Hey, Thomas, we've got the Spirit for you then, you know. Yeah, foreshadowing here. The Holy Spirit would be poured out on them. It would fill them just like breath fills our lungs. Only the Holy Spirit would give them the power to do what they needed to do. You know, the, the same apostles that were hiding here, they get drugged in front of the Sanhedrin. The same group of people that condemn Jesus, we command you not to do this. We're not listening to you. Same guys. The ones that were scared are now empowered to say, no, not listening to you. We're going to obey God. We don't care what you do to us. We're not going to disobey God. 
Same guys. Before this time, God's Holy Spirit only filled certain people at certain times for a certain task. But that would change on the day of Pentecost when every believer at the same time can be filled with the same Holy Spirit. During the Last Supper, right before Jesus was arrested and taken to the cross, he told his disciples these things. And that was in our opening reading. The Holy Spirit would show up. Jesus said, if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit can't come. So it's good that I leave so the Spirit will empower you. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would help lost people see their sin and their need for a Savior. The Holy Spirit's the one who does the convicting. Yes, we're to share, we're to teach, we're to preach. But the Holy Spirit's the one that gets to the heart. Jesus made promises about the Spirit. He'd be their friend. He would teach them. He'd help them. He would remind them of everything that Jesus said. So later on when things happened, when they did the Spirit, it did click. Oh, that's what Jesus meant. That's why this had to happen. So the Holy Spirit can help us remember, oh, Yep, yep, it can bring to mind verses. It can bring to mind times that God has rescued us from other situations. And he would give them the right words to speak at the right time. He said, when you're hauled in front of the authorities, don't worry about what to say. The Spirit will tell you. That's in Mark 13. Jesus did not ask his disciples to go and make disciples on their own. God never sends us out or never ask us to do anything without giving us the power to do it. Can I do anything on my own for the kingdom just by myself? At least probably nothing that would have probably any lasting effect. I'm going to do it myself. It's not going to work. So the, the disciples, they wouldn't have been able to go out and teach and preach and establish churches all on their own. God gave them the power. It should encourage us that Jesus' plan included men who made very big mistakes. Anybody here ever made a mistake? Every hand went up. I know, I know. But both went up, right? Maybe a leg. You know, been there, done that, right? These were not special men. They were regular people. That's even what the, the Jewish leaders thought. Like, These are uneducated, normal, regular guys. How are, they, how are they doing these things? Power of Jesus. At times weak. At times they lack faith. At times they thought only of themselves. Doesn't sound familiar, does it? Definitely not me. So we talked about the, the children of Israel. Oh man, they, they had their ups and downs and made mistakes. Uh, glad that's not me. Book of Numbers, a bunch of people just complaining. Yeah. That's us. We should be thankful that it's not about what we have to offer God. Because what do I have to offer God? Nothing. Here's some, here's some dirty rags, Lord. Do you want them? That's, that's all I got. But with Jesus, I can offer him everything I am. And he can use me. God sends the Holy Spirit to live inside all believers. He will use you and me. He'll guide us. He has the power and wants us to move. He wants to use us. At had our Sunday school lesson, we're his ambassadors. God speaks through us, telling people, come back to God. Who does God use to reach broken people? Other broken people, because that's who he has to use. Of course, Thomas said he had to see Jesus with his own eyes. He needed to fill the scars with his own hands to believe. And you're wondering, like, Thomas think, all my buddies are playing a joke on me? I don't believe it. But he didn't believe it. He said he had to see it. Because we don't hear much about the disciple Thomas. In fact, because this is only one of the few times he's mentioned, what is Thomas sadly known, known as? And that term's even still used today for someone that doubts. Oh, don't be a doubting Thomas. You know, it's not Thomas who also went out and did miracles. It isn't Thomas who also went out and taught and preached and healed people. This is what we remember. But Jesus knows hearts, minds. So when he appeared again, he spoke directly to Thomas. Jesus wasn't there when 
The disciples said, hey, Thomas, we saw the Lord. But he knows because he's Jesus. So he spoke directly to Thomas. He told him, touch my scars. Look, here they are. Here's my hands. Touch me. Feel. I am I'm real. I'm alive. Because we don't know if Thomas did touch Jesus' scars. It doesn't say that he did. It doesn't say he didn't. He may have believed the moment he saw Jesus and heard his voice. I think that might have been enough for me. Hey, Thomas. Oh, yeah. But notice Thomas's words. He didn't just say, now I believe you're alive. He said much more than that. He said, my Lord and my God. When Thomas saw that Jesus was raised from the dead, it proved to him who Jesus said he was. Again, there, there was no doubt at that point in his mind, was there? Oh, he, yeah. Everything he said he was, that's true. Because before he was crucified, Jesus told the disciples over and over what was going to happen. The chief priest would reject him. He'd be turned over. He'd be killed. But he'd be raised again on the third day. But the Bible does tell us that Jesus spoke figuratively. He spoke in parables. And sometimes the disciples didn't always, didn't always understand. They heard his words, but the meaning wasn't always clear. Sort of like seeing through a veil or a fog or a frosty window. You can tell someone's on the other side of it. You can make out the shape of a person, but you don't know who it is. It was only after Thomas saw Jesus alive and everything became clear to him. At that moment, Thomas confessed that Jesus was the Lord. Yeah. Verse 20, 29 again says, Jesus said, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. So who's Jesus talking about here? Has anyone in this room actually seen Jesus? I've not seen him. I've, I've not had a moment like Paul where I've not been out and Jesus just appeared to me. That's, you know, I've not seen him. We haven't seen him because he's in heaven. He's in heaven now. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding on our behalf, which I think that's one of the most amazing things. Jesus right now is talking to God about you and me. That one's mine. That one's mine. That one's mine. That's cool. Jesus here is talking about all people throughout history who have believed in him. That includes us. It was good for Thomas and the disciples to believe in him after they saw him raised from the dead. But it's even better for us to believe even though we have not seen him. We know, we've, we've heard stories. We've seen Jesus change people's lives, but we haven't seen him. There's a word for believing in what you have not seen. Anybody know Hebrews 11.1? 1? Faith. Simply, it's faith. So how do we believe something that we have never seen? We read the words of the people that saw him. Again, we see the change of, in people's lives. We can see the change in our own life. I used to be the most horrible person, right? But now I'm, I'm not. I used to be involved in this, that, and other things. And now I have no interest in that whatsoever. That's faith. The Bible was written to us, to you, to me. Here at the end of chapter 20, John makes it clear that he wrote the book to explain that Jesus was the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, that he is who we should have our hope and faith in. He was sent by God to take away the sins of the world. By all the amazing miracles Jesus did, he proved who he was, who else could do these things. Yet it takes faith to believe something we have never seen. Jesus said we would be blessed because we have faith in what we do not see. So if you're a believer this morning, you're blessed. You believe in Jesus because who he is. You've seen change. You've seen change in you. You've seen change in others. You believe the written word. So you're blessed by that. And we've been changed. Our, our jobs as someone that's been a partaker of the gospel is to now take it. We've received it. Now we give it. So share and lead other people to have the same faith that you do. That's the message.